Hi everyone, and welcome to Qualcomm. They've sponsored this video and invited me here to talk about a very special, special, special product. As you know, most smartphone companies do mid-gen refreshes, and today it's all about the Snapdragon 8 Plus Gen 1, the mid-season update from the Snapdragon 8 Gen 1. Normally, updates are bump in frequencies, maybe a little bit of extra efficiency. This time around, however, Qualcomm has gone above and beyond with their mid-season updates. Now, if you ever heard of qualms about Qualcomm's capabilities and quality, well, they may have solved that issue for you. What's your minimum specification? Today, Qualcomm's flagship smartphone SoC is a Snapdragon 8 Gen 1. It powers over 170 plus devices globally. As devices currently in the market or in production, and just like every other SoC manufacturer, when it comes time to update the SoC mid-cycle, you get another variation. In this case, we have the Snapdragon 8 Plus Gen 1. Now, it's fairly easy to put, you should think, to put out an update. You just bin it for a slightly higher frequency, cost is a bit more. We've seen even Qualcomm do this over previous generations. There is something, however, that makes this one different. Here in my hand right now is a Snapdragon 8 Plus Gen 1. This is the new chip. So the old chip was built on Samsung's 4 nanometer process. What makes this mid-generation update a little bit different is that Qualcomm is using TSMC, 4 nanometer, the N4 process, for it. Now you might think, well, why does this happen? Why is uh, Qualcomm moving from Samsung to TSMC? Ultimately, these decisions are made early on in the lifetime of the product. This isn't simply a reaction to whoever's process technology is best. Qualcomm decided to split, decided to dual source its uh, flagship tier smartphone this generation with the first iteration being on Samsung, and the second iteration being on TSMC. Now, I've even spoken with, Sa with uh, Qualcomm on this. Uh, Alex Katusian, one of their uh, senior VPs, he says that as a company, through the pandemic, through chip shortages, they go to whichever foundry has capacity for the product at the right time. And obviously, they have to plan this thing in advance, and some people think that we're slowly coming out of the chip shortage. Some people think that the chip shortage is still ongoing. But Alex said that while they fish around for the right foundry for the right product, their customers also fish around for the right SOC at the right time. So they've had customers going in and out of using Qualcomm chips and using competitors. But in the same way, Qualcomm will go from foundry to foundry to find the right foundry for the right process for the right product. So using TSMC's 4 nanometer obviously holds some of its distinct advantages based on what we already know about TSMC's uh, process in the market already. TSMC's 4 nanometer is slightly denser and you get slightly better performance per watt. And that's still true with the Snapdragon 8 Plus Gen 1. In the materials, Qualcomm is saying that this chip will offer up to 30% better performance per watt on the CPU and 30% more performance on the GPU at lower power. Today, I've been able to test one of these devices. So typically when Qualcomm comes out with a new SoC, especially a new flagship SoC, what it will do is it'll invite people, uh, press analysts from around the world to test one of these. This is the Qualcomm reference device, or in this case, for the Snapdragon 8 Plus Gen 1. I tested the reference device for the Qualcomm Snapdragon 8 Gen 1, and it looks very much similar. Um, reference device is helpful for testing the performance of these chips, but it also goes to partners and customers understand exactly what sort of device they could create with it. Now, as with most phones, you know, it's a shiny rectangle with a screen. The idea is that this is still a representative performance of the chip when it goes into customer devices, or at least an idealized performance. I mean, I have Snapdragon 8 Gen 1 devices, that perform worse than the equivalent reference design from Qualcomm, just because the customer there decided to put it into a thinner form factor or tweak some of the banding, tweak some of the thermal profiles. So with the Snapdragon 8 Plus Gen 1, what exactly are the differences between from Samsung 
to TSMC. So on the whole, the uh, CPU, the SoC is exactly the same. We've got the same uh, Cortex X2 as your prime core. You've got the uh, Cortex, ARM Cortex A710s as your medium cores and the uh, ARM Cortex A510s as the low end cores. It's a one plus three plus four design. You've still got Adreno graphics in there. You've still got a Hexagon DSP. You've still got the same uh, Wi-Fi baseband capabilities. What moving to TSMC 4 nanometer you know, mid-generation refresh has enabled Qualcomm to do is bump that Cortex X2 frequency from 2.995 gigahertz, not three gigahertz technically. And uh, as much as they would love to have put that onto uh, the side of that chip, unfortunately it wasn't. But with uh, the updated refresh, we then get 3.2 gigahertz on the Cortex uh, X2. On the medium cores and the low end cores, there are also frequency bumps. And then on the GPU, there's also another frequency bump there. What Qualcomm is saying here is that not only do we get frequency bumps due to the new process, we also get efficiency improvements. And that's one of the big stories Qualcomm's going to be saying here. With the new Snapdragon 8 Plus Gen 1, they're promoting an additional one hour of battery life while gaming. That's it. That's sort of like in the peak workload. If you're getting an additional 30% efficiency during a peak gaming workload, you know, an extra one hour means that a, a good phone will go from anywhere from three and a half to four and a half hours. Whereas when it comes to uh, social media browsing, the extra hour you get out of that is because social media browsing doesn't actually take that much power and you're already quite efficient regardless of what chip. But this also, tra the extra efficiency also translates into battery life uh, while browsing the web, uh, while consuming content. Everybody loves more battery life, right? It's hard to understate how much battery life matters. But that being said, you've still got to look at ultimate performance and performance per watt. Now, I did say this video is sponsored by Qualcomm. A lot of people are going to take that to mean, well, that means you're biased. One of the stipulations of uh, doing this piece with these guys is that when I get hands on with a device, I still get to do my independent testing. Uh, and this is essentially what I've done. We've run a number of benchmarks to see if what they can claim is totally accurate. And so here are the results of my testing. Now, the first test I usually like to bring up here is uh, what's called Spec Int 2017. This is a standardized set of workflows, uh, common in the industry for identifying where specific uh, CPU cores uh, perform well in various tasks, whether it's compute or memory bound. There's about 23, 28 different subtests and the ones that we can run on Android and uh, iOS on Apple, uh, we, can co we can collate and show here. Uh, what you're seeing is a geomean of all the tests we can run. And the idea of this graph is that the higher up the graph you go, the more performance you are, the higher performance you get. And going from left to right is the more energy you consume. So ideally you want the highest performing core using the lowest energy. So anything up in this top left is usually is usually a good thing. So um, key points here uh, out of the data that we've already got is uh, the apples. Obviously, to sit at the top, they're very efficient. And then the efficiency cores as well offer some good performance at really low power. Then here at the bottom, we've got some of the A55 designs. Uh, ARM Cortex A55 energy efficient cores are here at the bottom. And so far, the best one is uh, in the Dimensity 1200. And then moving up through uh, through some of these more uh, cores here in the middle, we've got uh, Dimensity. Uh, everything in yellow is uh, MediaTek. Everything blue is Samsung. And everything in orange is Qualcomm. And so we've got some of Qualcomm's chips here. Snapdragon 865. They've got the mid-range A77s. You've got the Snapdragon 8088, the uh, Performance A78 cores. Then moving up, we've got the Snapdragon 888X1 going up to the Snapdragon 8 Gen 1 X2, ARM Cortex 8 X2, uh, performs around here and uses this much power. And then for the Snapdragon 8 Plus Gen 1, this new uh, generation update built on TSMC, the extra uh, frequency in the X2 core means that uh, we get some extra performance here. It's about 6 or 7% extra performance, but we're running at about 10% less power as well. So your energy efficiency is going between 16 and 20% uh, better performance per watt. You know, and with these uh, mid-gen refreshes, that's what you really want. You want better, more performance or more efficiency, or if you can get it both. 
So this is a big uplift. Uh, one of the issues here, we were only able to test the performance cores on, on the uh, reference device. Uh, there were some settings stopping us, uh, not, not allowing us to run it on the other cores. Um, but we'll see if we can get a device in hand and see whether that's different or that's just a software thing. But this is uh, spec int and then Corrie we have the floating point performance and the bubbles look roughly uh, in the same place. Uh, moved around slightly again the Snapdragon 8 Plus Gen 1 X2 is more performant in using less power than the um, Snapdragon 8 Gen 1. A little still bit behind uh, Apple's A14 and A15 performance cores but we're seeing you know, a good positioning here uh, from, from Qualcomm or where it is. Now, this is obviously single core performance. What about multi core performance? And this is where we turn to Geekbench 5. And what I've done here is I've plotted single threaded score on the X axis and multi threaded score on the Y axis. As we've got these data points from de devices we've tested. Some data has been taken from the Geekbench 5 database, particularly this MST 9000 score. Um, it's important to point that out. Uh, still waiting to get a device with Dimensity 9000 in to test. But we're seeing here that the Snapdragon 8 Gen 1 going to the 8 Plus Gen 1, you get a sizable increase in single-threaded performance and multi-thread performance as well, uh, using that additional uh, efficiency it equates to performance. What we've got here is essentially um, Apple A13's um, single-core performance, but much more multi-threaded performance. And uh, it's fun to see if you just plot the orange points here in this curve with uh, the red. And there you get this kind of like Qualcomm's uplift over time. And we've also got um, Huawei's last attempt, the Kirin 9000 here on the left. So that's it for CPU results. But we can go into the GPU results, which gets a little more interesting. So first off, here is GFX Bench Manhattan 3.1. Off screen, we're testing it at um, room temperature. And the plot here uh, on the y-axis is frames per second. So obviously the higher, the better. And on uh, this bottom axis here, we've got total system active power. That's the power used by uh, the smartphone minus the power of, uh, of the lowest brightness screen possible. And what we get here is actually a really nice surprising result on two factors. One, we can see the Snapdragon 8 Plus Gen 1 uh, with the uh, Qualcomm reference design, is higher performance than the uh, A15 in the iPhone 13 Pro. And it's also much less power. We're talking about almost 20% here from the Snapdragon 8 Gen 1 in the uh, Honor Magic 4 Pro. So this is a sizable difference in performance per watt. Now, Qualcomm's numbers officially are stating 30%. We're getting about 30% here. Uh, going through the numbers it's it's quite funny that that's lined up perfectly well so do we have a processor here that's better at gaming than than the iphone well uh, you know you're, you're getting a slightly extra performance and there is a power differential um, but manhattan is an old test it's designed uh, before any of these uh, processors are really in the market so we can go on to more strenuous uh, benchmarks. So we can go to GFX Bench Aztec. This is the normal setting. So this is 1080p. And we get a very similar um, you know, positioning of uh, Snapdragon 8 Plus Gen 1. It's uh, much lower power than the Snapdragon 8 Gen 1. Um, but it's also more performant than the uh, Apple A15. Uh, again, you've still got a small uh, power differential here between the two. But I think for a mid-gen refresh, we're still getting about 30% performance per watt improvement in gaming. Now, this is 1080p. Some smartphones obviously go above and beyond that. So let's go to Aztec High off-screen, where it is 1440p. And we can see that the performance per watt between Snapdragon 8 Plus Gen 1 and the Apple A15 SoC and the 13 Pro is getting very, very close. Still a big uplift from previous gen, uh, Snapdragon 8 Gen 1 to 8 Plus Gen 1. But we're now getting a, a little bit closer here. So I will say that these gaming tests are done with a small caveat. These are done peak performance. So this is literally first run stuff. Unfortunately, you know, with the time with the device, there's no real opportunity to do sustained performance testing. Uh, we'll have to do that when we actually get hands on with the device 
So it'll be interesting to see how uh, these spots kind of move down into requiring lower power and lower performance when they're already in you know a 20 30 minute gaming uh, scenario but it's great to see, see here between all the um all the gaming benchmarks at least at peak at least first run that we're getting good uh performance per watt improvements going from Snapdragon 8 Gen 1 to 8 Plus Gen 1 yeah between these three gaming benchmarks this is not what i was expecting especially the significant power jump performance jump is is very nice but that power jump i think people are gonna, definitely going to feel that together they're going to feel that in the battery life and uh yeah as i said before everybody loves battery life when you're even if you've got the same chip or the equivalent of the same chip from two different foundries there is still going to be a lot of internals that are different when um companies are bringing up this device we're talking about clock skews and uh what at what point do you move into the higher cores go down to the lower cores but at the end of the day, that also is where you gain the performance and the efficiency. Um, and on top of that, you also have the software to deal with. So there are things that can be done in software. And we see these with the gaming phones, right? The gaming phones with gaming modes, they just jack everything up to the maximum cores and you get the best performance here. I've tried my best to do apples to apples. Now, I tested the Snapdragon 8 Gen 1 reference design back in December at a Qualcomm's Tech Summit event. I'm very clear that I use my own software and not their pre-downloaded apps just to make sure that there's no funny business. And the version I tested today, very similar settings. And uh, I'm grateful because sometimes that sometimes if you just take uh, a company's numbers or a company's software, you don't know where it's been. So um, I'm very much at the forefront of making sure I do that sort of testing. What I like about a reference design is that usually it's some of the best performance that a chip can be. And uh, the, if, if, if things like this came into mini PCs, that would be my dream. Um, but we'll wait and see. So as you might expect, the mid-generation refresh of uh, an SoC into the smartphones, we'll likely see this in the smartphones coming out in the second half of the year. Uh, that's when you know companies... Uh, uh, especially Chinese companies, they update uh, their smartphones. We're going to see uh, this chip in a few of those, and also, I suspect, a few gaming phones. Now, one of the criticisms of the Snapdragon 8 Gen 1 from a few in the media was that it got a little bit hot. The yeah. idea of moving to TSMC, hopefully with a better power efficiency, is that, get, that it gets around that. Now, I would have loved to have tested this device um, for a lot, lot longer, uh, unfortunately, the nature of these things is that uh, it's it's almost a passing fancy. Fancy sometimes, you get a few hours. Uh, I was actually able to test the phone for at least a day, um, which is uh, more than perhaps I should have been allowed to. However, moving m moving forward, we're going to see this in end devices end of the year, and it'd be good to pick one of those up to test. Now, other companies will do their other mid generation refreshes. We're going to see a few of those. Uh, coming out in due course. So it'll be interesting to compare a traditional mid-season refresh, uh, mid-generation refresh to this, which is more akin to a fundamental change, especially when changing foundry. Now the question is, which foundry has the best process and how do you make the best chip on what you have access to? What do you think? If you like this content, please don't forget to like and subscribe. We also have now a private Discord server. And if you want access to that, become a Patreon member and it'll instantly add you as long as your emails are linked. You can join the Patreon for as little as $1.50 a month and it all goes back into helping the channel. Thank you for your support.